again, these information touts and these, these guys are just doing, giving picks out for, you know, for just clout and everything. And then you realize, like, you know what I mean? You guys have no idea. You think life is full of check bo- check marks and money bags mm-hmm. on Twitter or red X's. And, and, and this is my livelihood you're talking about where you can just trivialize it. Hey, what's up, everybody? GP13 here, joined today by a true legend in the space, uh, someone that actually has kind of inspired me to start making my own podcast. And I think a lot of what I've done with this has been modeled off of my guest Spanky, his podcast, Be Better Betters. And it's, yeah, been waiting for this day for a while. I can't believe I can uh, can have you on, man. Thanks for joining Hey, GP, thanks so much for having me. The pleasure's all mine, Um, and um, I I look forward to having a great conversation with you. Awesome. Well, I know you like to to start off with how is life growing up, but I wanted to throw a curveball, and I want to say, why are are Greeks such good betters? Yeah, uh, that's funny. Uh, You know, that's a great question. You know, um, I think... um, I don't know. I think it just it, it's, most people that are good at betting like math, and I think math is, is usually a, a fundamental uh, a basis for everything. Um, and if you liked math in school, and if you liked solving problems, and if you like playing games um, and, and solving puzzles, I guess that kind of translates into sports betting. So I think that's probably um, – and then, you know, also like having a good time too. Um, so, you know, work hard, play hard model. Yep. And you, speaking of, you know, being proficient in math, your background, for people who may not know who you are, you started, you worked for a bank, right, before you started uh, gambling full-time? Yeah, I worked for Deutsche Bank um, right on Wall Street, 70 Wall. And, um, you know, and then I I started doing this on on a part-time basis, uh, betting sports, and I was making more money part-time than I was working on Wall Street. So then... um, it pretty much uh, was a no-brainer to take the plunge and start betting sports professionally. And since 2003, that's all I've been doing exclusively um, since '03. But um, I've been betting sports since, you know, in the mid-'90s, but um, exclusively professionally since '03. That's, ama- that's amazing. I have to assume that's like one of the longest careers currently currently running. Uh, in sports betting, I'm not sure about that. You know, there's a guy, a lot of guys, um, you know, that have been doing, it, and there's still a lot of Billy Walters, of course, is, sure. is the, the, the goat. Um, he's been doing it, and Billy Baxter, my God, Billy, Billy Baxter's Baxter. been, um, has been, been, you know, betting for so long. So, I'm still a young up and comer, in my opinion, compared Let's to these go. guys. Um, so I'm still trying to learn, and uh, you know, that that's um. You know, you never, you, you never, once you think, uh, you never have an attitude of, I know it all. Um, never, never like that. You always could learn from even, even young guys. Um, you know, not just the older generation, but from the new generation. Um, a lot of things have passed me by, but I still like to keep up to date and kind of learn from guys like you and others um, to see if I could um, find a way to supplement my edge. And, you know, because listen, you know, if you just stay stagnant and if you don't adapt, um, you slowly start, you know, getting stepped on and pushed down the ladder and then, um, you know, you're scrambling. So, you know, we always want to keep up to date and, and make sure that we're on top of it and, and have the um, uh, the best of it and, and, and still to maintain a high profitability. Definitely. And it's 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 something that I think a lot about because to me, there feels like this existential crisis around like losing an edge and always constantly being on that hunt. Right. Like it's, it's almost like you can't be still. And that's like, it seems like something you've had to come to accept doing it since 2003 as just like the nature of the job, but it's hard. Like what advice would you give younger people like me, people who are uh, watching this podcast here like a year or two in, start to see one of their edges going away or get patched by a book? Like what, what advice do you have for them? Well, you know, the advice I, I would always say is you, you never, um, you, you, you can never be, be content 
on the current on the status quo. Um, you know, when we start off our football season, you know, we have about 27, 2,800 accounts. Right. Um, and to that, for somebody, I'm like, oh my God, that's it. Everything's great. Um, we have several different handicappers, several different people we pair up with. Oh man, it's great. But I assume that we don't, we, we, you know, we're down to our last account. I assume we're down to our last bit of it. So I'm always hunting for more, yep. never happy, never accepting the status quo because things don't last. Outs don't last. Edges don't last. Um, partnerships don't last. You can never assume, although some partnerships have lasted a long time, but you never assume that anything lasts. You always assume that it's over or that it's going to be over tomorrow. And that keeps you hungry. And that, you know, and, and you always, you know, the way we're looking at edges now is I'm not interested in something that's going to be good for a few days or good for a week. You know, I'm not in for that. Like, I don't have time to put all the resources in to make the quick scores. And some people make a living off that. And God bless them. We're looking for more long-term relationships, long-term edges that we could slowly extract and slowly exploit and um, and, 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 and make it and try to squeeze as much, uh, as much juice for a long time. And I always look for more long-term edges than short plays that are, that are, um, that are only uh, temporary. So, um, that, that's, that's the big thing. But again, to build your bankroll and stuff, um, not everybody could be a selective, you know what I mean? People got to take whatever comes their way. Um, you know, uh, I'm at a point in my career where I can, I can say no and I could take a pass. Um, and I could say, nah, you know, not for me. But, um, whereas, you know, when we're coming up in a business, you know, you're so hungry that anything that comes your way, you take. But now, you know, you got to think about long-term strategy, account longevity, relationships. There's just so many games within the game that we play. Yeah, I, the game within a game is a reoccurring theme on Be Better Betters. And I think that was what opened my mind to thinking about, like, there's there's winning, right? And then there's, but you have to, you're thinking about it, I think, in terms of, making money. So when you, when you t- talk about passing opportunities, like some, I'll even get opportunities that people bring to me, but I've learned to say no to, because it's just not the, the trade-off isn't, isn't right at the, at the moment, but it's, it's knowing those trade-offs, building relationships, investing for stuff down the line that will pay off. It's the big gains I think to get from winning to career gambler come what we would say in poker, like off the, off the felt, right? Like off the table. No, well said. I, I think that, um, you know, I made a podcast episode winning is just the beginning. Yep. Um, and the, the name didn't even come to me when I taped it. I just said it while I was taping it. And then I just called it. That was the episode title, but it's a great episode. Really uh, was. yeah. And I, I think people don't understand, you know, until you do this and until you're engulfed in it and until you're doing this all day, every day, you, you know, people, um, they think, my God, if I could just have the winning plays, if I could just, you know, um, I could know um, um, who's going to win this game or who's going to cover the spread, I'll be, I'll, I'll experience financial freedom and, and, and my life will be so much better. When, you know, when in all reality, you know, you could give somebody tomorrow's newspaper and they still won't be able to make it work. It just doesn't, you know what I mean? It, 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 it has nothing to do with um with winning it, it has to do with with making it last because again I, and I've, I've said this so many times you know you, you can have the best model the best method the best outs it doesn't you know but but if if you can't if you can't make it last or if you can't have a bookmaker um constantly to to to, to, to take that action um then then Winning is nothing. You know what I mean? You got you have to have that longevity and you have to have a bookmaker that pays. You know, there's so many so many facets of it. I went into it. I can't really I don't want to repeat the whole podcast, but you know, I kind of um I really spilled my heart out on that because, you know, I, I see so many people that are, you know, again, these information touts and these these guys are just doing giving picks out for you know, for just clout and everything. And then you realize like, you know what I mean? You guys have no idea. You think life is full of check, bo- check marks and money bags yeah. on Twitter or red X's. And, and, and this is my livelihood you're talking about where you can just trivialize it to check marks and money bags or X's and all right, on to the next day. And it's not, it's not like that. Um, you know, I have to have more checks than X's to feed my family. 
Um, and I have to be able not just have checks. I have to find bookmakers or find ways to be able to bet this stuff so that they'll be accepting it, whether willingly or unwillingly, for a long period of time. So, um, and then it just the list goes on and on. Yeah, and the that brings up an interesting point of like having to win, and touts don't really have to win, and they don't get what it's like to be in the arena, right? And something that you've said and something that I think and a lot of the people I look up to is basically like this dis when people like start talking about Kelly, right? It's like, instead of talking about how to optimize your bet sizing for your life and for your growth, right? And like living to fight another day. So when I hear a lot of people talk about Kelly, I mean, you worked in a you worked in a bank, right? And you, I'm I'm sure there was like a lot of risk protocols that you saw in Wall Street. Like when you think about risk and think about bet sizing, can you can you tell like some of the younger people who might just be like smashing half Kelly plays in there, like what kind of nuanced view you have of how to account for risk, how to make your life easier by always, you know, living to fight another day and being able to lose every single bet, right? And get back in there. Yeah, you know you just said it you hit you said it again. Um you're definitely an avid listener, uh, GP. So you know you can see you're repeating a lot of the stuff I I, I you're it's like you're reading my mind. But yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, you know to me the most important thing is 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 if I lose every single bet. Yeah, and when I mean, when I say every single bet, I mean every single bet, today, tomorrow, the next day, the day after, the day after that, will I be able in a week from now if I lost every bet to be able to bet on that eighth day? And if the answer is no, then you're betting too much. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing. And 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 I think that um, I think people, you know, I don't care what you use, half Kelly, quarter Kelly, whatever, whatever you're doing, you just have to be able to make sure. You know, in this game, um, you know, sure, this Kelly, you want to minimize risk, maximize return, have that optimal, uh, optimal uh, um, balance. But I would sacrifice um, EV. I would sacrifice a return to make sure that you do not go broke. That's the, the most important thing is, you know, the risk of ruin, you want to avoid that, you want to make sure, and no matter what, and, and most people, it's, you know, not that, you know, you make your standards, you say, okay, I'm going to bet this and that, and then people sort, you know, they're just, it, it, it's cheating, it's discipline, people, oh man, I, I'm going to just, you know, just bet a little bit more this time, try to get even, or, you know, we're humans, um, we're not robots, um, and most people, very, it's, it's hard for betters, especially new betters, to and even established betters. I've met some of the smartest math handicappers, guys that are unbelievable, that are surefire winning winners, that have unbelievable models. But when it came to actually gambling and betting, they would probably go broke in a month or two, even with a winning model, because they just don't understand how to manage risk and how to make sure that they don't go broke. And that's the problem. And I think that, to me, is everything. Um, and that just came out of a necessity. You know, when I leave a job on Wall Street and I start doing this and I, I'm just newly married, I start building a family, I can't go broke. I, you know, I can't go back working a nine to five. So I made sure, I'm like, listen, I'm going to leave money on the table. And I was fine with that um, as long as I make sure that, you know, I... Uh, I am, I'm never going to go bust or go tapioca. Now, there's a lot of people in this business that have been successful. Billy Walters, for example, been broke several times and he wind up finally making it. That's not me. Um, and I just can't put myself in a situation where I put, you know, I go all in on something and, um, and then have to rebuild, you know, uh, it's not my, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm risk averse when it comes to that. Uh, it's crazy because that's literally what I did. I left, I was working on wall street, making more money, betting on sports left and couldn't go broke newly married. I, I, it's actually, I didn't know that about you. I, I'm sure I had heard it, but yeah, that, that's, that shaped my life too, is just, it's not an option and it makes you better. But when you mentioned someone like Billy, 
he went broke and then he kind of like had a aha moment. Right. And then it's, you know, I mean, now I'm sure he has no risk of risk of ruin, but I think it's an interesting story because I come from poker and there's a lot of examples of that in poker. But uh, what would you say to somebody who is kind of in that spot where they're making that decision? This is for a small portion of the audience, but like I did, like you did, to consider leaving their job. What's what? What would you? What advice would you tell them? Because I get asked this a lot, and I actually don't feel comfortable giving uh, advice on it because it's such a big decision. You know, I uh, I would never. You know, listen, it's hard because I, I, you know, everyone was against me when I decided to leave my job. Nobody backed me up, really, including my wife. You know what I mean? Although she eventually had my back, but she was questioning it, as she should. You know, you're making a, you have a uh, six-figure income here. You're going to leave that behind and go bet sports for a living? Like, what the hell? And this is back when betting sports was, you know, a lot more taboo than it is today. Um, where, you know, a professional sports better was just, that that's unheard of. Um, so, uh, I don't know. I, I just... I don't want to deter anybody from following their dreams. Um, but I think the best way is to try to do both at the same time, if you can, and keep those both of those balls up in the air and kind of work two jobs at once until you can prove to yourself, because that's what I did, um, that I could actually, you know, be successful at this. Um, and, and that's the key thing. And sometimes... You know, I know there's, if you're really good, let's just say at poker or whatever, there's guys that'll stake you. There's guys that'll put you on a free roll. There's, there's opportunities where you could limit your risk. Sure, you won't make as much money, but at least you limit your risk so that you're protected against that storm, that pending, you know, that, that storm that you know is going to come. You just don't know when it's going to come. Um, you know, the most important thing about any gambler's life, any pro gambler, is not not um, if you're going to experience a hellacious run, it's when you're going to experience a hellacious run, and will you be ready for it? Sometimes it happens later in life, which is, you know, great, that's great luck for you. But there's several people that happens right out of the gate, and then if that happens, then, you know, people just go bust off. So, you know, you want to prepare yourself because it's, it's happened to all of us. And um, another podcast episode I may call Be Better Losers, um, which kind of teaches you the mentality of accepting, um, of, 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 of knowing that, you know, you, you, being a gambler doesn't have a guaranteed paycheck. So um, I hope that kind of answered the no, question. That, that's exactly what I would recommend is, I think it's like keep doing, I, I don't think I came up with this, but someone said this where it's like, keep doing both. And obviously it's a grind until it's like costing you money to stay at your job, mm. you know? And I well, thought so. that was good because I felt like it finally reached a point where I couldn't justify staying at my job uh, for the money I was giving up on sports. And Beautiful. that's a, that's a somewhat objective way to, it's hard to make an objective decision in that moment. It's your life. And there's so much that hinges on it, but I felt like that was a good way to kind of like make it more mathematical. So and which is basically kind of going along with with what you said, but you know, certainly a tough decision. No matter what, I think it was probably one of the toughest decisions of my life. And no one's going to really, um, I don't. Not many people, uh, not many people pat me on the back for making the the decision either, uh, Spanky. So I don't think that that that's going to be one thing you have to prepare for is for people to to question it, um, and that's certainly not easy. Exactly, but no one's going to know better on what the right decision is than you, right? So you, that, that's the thing. So you have to you, – you, you, you take the advice, but you know that ultimately it's your decision. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm glad that you made the right decision. Thank you. All right, so let's say we made, we made that decision. A lot, of, uh, a lot of people in the audience, in my audience, have been really interested in top-down strategies. They might be coming from – in arbitrage strategy, they might be a year into betting. I use I use Spank Odds, not even an advertisement, but that's Spanky's odd screen. You know, I personally just use it. It's a great odd screen. Uh, you're known as you know one of the most prolific top down betters. What can you kind of give 
a brief rundown of what you consider to be like a top-down strategy for the audience, and then we can kind of break into a uh, more in-depth strategy discussion. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so top-down betting, which is a phrase I coined um, many years ago on Ed Fang's podcast, just came to me. I don't, you know, a lot of the shit I just make up off the fly, and it just sticks. <laughs> and I, then I we know. we all use it for years. Yeah, everybody like, starts using like... it. You know, but this is I'm just yeah. describing my life and how. I, so I look at it as, um, you know, I have a diagram of a top-down strategy versus a bottom-up strategy. Okay. You know, um, where you have, it's like, a, I looked at it, it's like I'm there sitting and there's a pot of gold right there and I'm just putting my hand in it and just taking the gold as I please when nobody's looking. Um, whereas you have all these bottom up handicappers where they're trying to climb this big ladder, they're bottom up, they're cl- trying to climb up and there's them, so many of them are falling off the ladder. Some of the rungs are broken. Um, I shared this image on Twitter a while, a while ago. I probably should dig it up, but that's, um, you know, it, it's hard to do a bottom-up strategy. And then some people finally make it, and they're able to get to the pot of gold, um, where I'm always going to be next to the pot of gold. So what is a top-down strategy? The top-down strategy is essentially assuming that the line is efficient, but you're looking for something, one piece of information that makes it inefficient. The, um, now, people trivialize, some people that don't do this for a living, might trivialize what is top-down. Top-down essentially is, is if you have 10 bookmakers and uh, nine bookmakers are going moving a game and they go from five to four, then you have that one slow bookmaker at five, so you take the plus five. Okay, uh, and that's the steam chasing part of top-down charging. But there is so much more than just that. They think, okay, that's what it is. It's just steam chasing. Absolutely not. Um, a top-down strategy is looking for information and looking to try to anticipate where the line's going to move. Not just betting slow outs, although betting slow outs are great. Other pieces, other ways you can exploit where the line is going to move essentially is by watching bookmakers' patterns that are not so well known. So it doesn't, you know, you can, you could, um, like, you know, I could see a bookmaker and, and, and that, that is unknown to most people in the world. And I see them going from five to four, the world could be painted five. And I'm the one that could move certain, certain places taking plus five when there's not even one, there's only one four out there that very few people know about. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to understand information where you're looking at injuries and you're able to beat the bookmakers to information. And we specialize in that. And we're a, we, we, we share that knowledge with spank odds users um, where we're able to know. Um, and, we you know, again, this is an information network that has taken me two decades to develop where I have different beat writers, different connections. I'm not going to mention everything, every, sure. all the different type of people I have. Sure. But, you know, lo and behold, this isn't just Twitter. This is um, guys that are just in the game that just know information. And um, and um, you kind of just know that. And you, and, and if, you have your, if you're privy to information before it's released to the public, then you're able to use that. And, and, and know that, hey, wait a minute, that line is not correct because this information is not reflected in the said line. Another thing you could do is hand, knowing what groups are betting what, knowing handicappers' tendencies. So if I see lines steaming and if I see, I'll just throw, an, I don't know, I'll just pick any random team, Iona, and Iona is always getting bet every game. It seems Iona, every time Iona opens up, and then Iona opens four, closes five, opens four, closes six, opens two, closes three. So you just see that. Once you start seeing that, then you realize, okay, Listen, you know, when I, uh, or, or, and you look for patterns amongst teams, then you're able to anticipate line movement and get ahead of it before the line actually moves. A top down strategy is essentially beating the closing line in some way, shape, or form. And steam chasing is the most basic way to do that. But there are so, so many other different ways to do it. And I just mentioned a couple here today. No, I love it. And that's it, it. Yeah. The way the discourse is, is like top, top down equals steam chasing, which is, you know, I think that's a limiting belief that, that you can have in what you're talking about. I love the example of the market being painted five. You see one book that no one looks at go five to four and you'll bet into the entire 
into the world <laughs> at five, you know, like, uh, and it's, it's, it's like doing your research. It almost feels like you're, you're a poker player looking for tells, looking for betting exactly. patterns. Like, exactly. You're playing the players of the game. So you're handicap handicapping the handicappers. You know, some people decide to handicap the teams and they'll look at the player stats and do all this and actually look at the teams. I don't give a shit about any of that. All I care about is where the line's going to go. Because I know on a college basketball game, if I bet a game plus five and it closes three and a half, I know I'm going to make money in the long run. No, 100%. There's no, oh, man, maybe you might not know. I know that. So once you know that, then that's what you want to do. If you beat the closing line, you know, people say, hey, how do you win at betting sports? I tell them beat the closing line. That's the first step. That's that's better than picking winners because beating the closing line will ultimately lead to picking winners in the long run. It might not in a week, in a day, in a week, in a month, in a short sample. It, okay, oh man, this closing line shit is garbage. I don't know why I'm, you know, but at the end of it all, trust me, I've built my career out of this. Um, when you beat the closing line, you're going to make money. Um, you just have to know how to, and and, and that that's where the you know that's where the, the 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 information comes through. And again, I you know. To, uh, it, it takes hard work to do so, uh, GP, and, and, and like you said, that plus for knowing that one bookmaker that goes to four, how do you find that bookmaker out? I just research, I watch, I learn, and this bookmaker is not on odd screens. You know, I would have a bookmaker that I would get a rundown from back in the day, um, or they I'd get a rundown from them on Skype, and this guy was in some basement in China somewhere, and once I got that rundown, I'd give them a few plays, but that rundown told me everything I needed to know. Um, and, 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 and that was the information that you needed, that I needed to make a killing off of. You know what I mean? Like I would, for that bookmaker to just simply give me a rundown of his numbers, that was just worth thousands to me. It was literally, it was worth thousands of dollars to know what that bookmaker's lines were. Imagine that, like, you know what I mean? Like, just think about that for a second. Knowing what a bookmaker's lines are that nobody else knows um, is worth so much money because you know then where the markets, you know, like, and all, how does, because that bookmaker was privy to the information being bet by some of the biggest syndicates in the world. Um, and for me to get that information and again, utilize it and not blow up the world and not blow up, you know, the, but, but for me to also go and, you know, essentially being a top down better in that sense makes the world's best handicappers indirectly work for me. Now, when I say that, people get pissed off. Oh, shit. Thank <laughs> you. Look, how, this is intellectual property, and how dare you? I've worked I've worked my life building these models. I've done so much to, to build these models, and, and you're just over here just stealing it from me. And I'm not – the minute you place one bet in the world with anybody or you give that information – to yeah. anybody in the world to move them, that information is no longer yours. Now, it's different if I went into your hotel room and stole your laptop or I stole your, No, we're not hacking anybody or nothing like that. But we try to find out where this, you know, the sharp money is and then, and then utilize that to our advantage. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, so if you want to call me an infant, people have called, I've been called every derogatory name in the world. Um, um, and, 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 you know, uh, but, but they, they should probably attach the word rich before it. So if you want to call me a thief, I'm a rich thief. If you want to call me a bottom feeder, sure, I'm a rich bottom feeder. Whatever you want to call me, I don't give a shit. Maybe you should attach the word rich in front of me because that's what I've done. Like, I've made money doing this. And, um, and, and I think the, the, the key thing is this is how I was able to find my edge. Um, and I don't knock anybody for doing anything. Any way you could find an edge where you're not altering the outcome of a game, um, or not, you know, that's the key thing. You know what I mean? We're not buying players or paying off or doing anything illegal, but it's an information game. And I realized I'm not going to be the smartest handicapper in the world. I'm not going to be the smartest mathematician in the world or the best modeler in the world. And, and, but best believe I'm going to be the best information guy there is. And, and that's what I strive to do. Sorry for the long rant. No, I think there's – well, it actually reminded me. I thought the the best – the best um, what was it? The best uh, promo of Spank Gods was Haralabob. He was like, 
So yeah, Spanky always seemed to get my plays. So this service is probably pretty good. <laughs> and he like posted or whatever. And I was yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, and, 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 and it's a cat and mouse game. And, and Bob, listen, Bob is one of the best NBA betters that ever lived. Um, and um, in order to work for Bob and move his games, he would want 50,000, 100,000. Um, and I didn't want to, I, I, you know, I don't want to deal with that. You know what I mean? We didn't want to get involved in that. Um, so instead, I would want it to get it for free. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and of course, he would not want me to get it. But you know what? The minute again, you start placing bets into these markets, we're going to find out. And and he, you know, him and Billy Walters, everyone has cursed me out eventually. Again, these are all my friends now and everybody. You know, at the time, all these big betters, the best in the world, have, have called me names and have said bad things about me only because I was getting that information. Um, because, you know, and again, I would love to deal with these guys directly, but if I can't, then I'm going to have to find a way to get mine. You know what I mean? I got to get mine. I got to do what I got to do to make sure that my company and, um, uh, and, and my, my pockets are lined up. Um, and that's the thing. Again, I'm not, uh, you know, it, it's an information game. And um, Spank Gods, I, I've, you know, this is an internal software that I've shared with the world to share all these lines. And there's a lot of lines we have on Spank Gods that are available nowhere in the world. But frankly speaking, and I'm going to be real with everybody, there's a lot of lines on Spank Gods. Um, there's a lot of lines that we have internally that I still have not shared on Spank Odds. I'm just, I'm being real. Like, oh, Spank, you, how could you hold back? Well, I'm hold, of course I'm going to hold back. You know what I mean? We might, I'm, you think I'm giving you everything? Uh, you know, I, I can't, you know what I mean? I, the 500 a month that people pay or 600 a month, um, you know, like, again, these are worth, to get a rundown of one day's rundown is worth thousands of dollars. Like, I'm not going to, you know, you, you can't. This stuff is so important to me, you know, but we try to give as much as we can, as long as it doesn't hurt our earn to, to a big extent. No. So, um, but I thank you for the uh, Spank Gods endorsement, especially for somebody like you, GP means a lot. No, I, I, it's a, it's a great service and it's well worth, uh, it's much worth much more than, than it costs. But I, I feel you on that of like giving something away and not giving everything away. Like I like to, to give away if not like content information, education. Um, but some people will be like, Hey, can you tell me like exactly how you price this golf this week for free? And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, I'm not even, people will ask to move. And actually going back to the Haral above example, like I do, uh, he's obviously much, much better, you know, better than me, but like there is, I think probably why he, he, you know, was like, Oh, you know, gave the endorsement. It's like, it is also on you as, an originator to not leak, to try not to leak as, as much as possible. You know, there's, there's steps around, you know, you, you could have to, there's always a trade off when you're, someone's getting down for you. And that's part of the game. A hundred percent. And, 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 and all the best betters, Billy Walters or all, whatever, anybody that's, that's been successful to a really big degree have realized that, or, or have, have implemented and, 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 and added to their repertoire that having the winning play, is really like not really like it, it, it. Sure, it's great and all, but really that's just the beginning. Again, winning is just the beginning. The most important thing is getting down. Like there is nothing. You ask anybody, what would you rather have? I asked Tiger, who's an unbelievable better world, you know, well renowned, well, one of the best, ran one of the best syndicates in the world. What would what would be more important, having a winner, the winning play, winning plays, or being able to get down? And he goes, without a doubt, being able to get down, knowing, you know, knowing, knowing how to, you know, longevity, how to be able to get down and have enough outs because the winner winning plays, if you know how to get down, will come to you. You will automatically become the bell of the ball. Like when you, when you go, you know, we run a conference called Bet Bash um, and, um, you know, guys that have outs, they're like the bells of that ball. When people find out somebody has outs, people want to go talk to them because they know that this is so important to their future. You know, and these are winning gamblers, very well-established gamblers. But when having outs is so important because you can, again, having the best model, being able to be the best winner can only take you so far. If you don't have a bookmaker to bet those plays into, you can have the best winners. It means nothing. Totally. And I, I had a, I had like a Twitter poll 
I think I said, would you rather a have a DraftKings account that would never get limited no matter what, or b be the best football player, football handicapper in the world? And like most of the smart people said, DraftKings account, you know, that you can just keep pounding because it's exponential, right? You'll just, you know, roll up the the, you know, the you'll just like pile it on. But I guess if you're the the best football handicapper and you work with someone like you, Spanky, maybe maybe there's more value there. Um, but I want to talk about the the value of unique information because you mentioned that sheet that you would get from a, a bookmaker in China. And it's like, you said it's worth thousands, but it's worth thousands, right? Because you're the only person probably that's seeing it or one of the few people who knows what to do with it that's seeing it. Like if that bookmaker put that gave that sheet to 30 more people, it would start to go down in value, right? So it's like protecting and finding those situations where you have you're kind of the only person aware of that information. Yeah, but again, you know, listen, but by the time the game would tip, the information would be known all around the world. Yeah. Um it's about how fast you can get that information, how you can react to that information, and the most important part which should be very clear is how to ensure that that information network, that tunnel will still exist tomorrow. You know what I mean? If I, if I call the bookmaker, he gives me a rundown and all of a sudden, right after the rundown, you know, the world blows up and all the numbers are, are, are every number that he's off market on all those numbers move. Then that's it. It's over. The bookmaker will know it was because of me. The better that's betting into that bookmaker will say, what the hell was that? So I'm, I, I, I have to know that whenever, and I'm, I give the bookmaker action. So I give him business so he doesn't give me this information for free. And then I'm able to bet my quiet outs or my, to be able to get down myself so that the ecosystem, the, the market, as we say, is not affected. I'm able to still get mine. My beak got a little water on it where I'm able to drink for the day. The guys that are betting were able to drink. The bookmaker is able to drink. Everybody's earning. And if everybody's earning, everybody's happy. The minute you stop somebody from earning is when things, you know, get out of whack. Definitely. And I think this is a good time to talk about just the U.S. regulated books, the offshores you know what i i want to hear you you've been someone who's very vocal about uh kind of how how tragic some of these bookmakers are in the u.s and like i i would agree as we we would call them dressmakers right um and that's but, another one yeah, that's be, a, a, that's, be a bookmaker not a dressmaker that's a bookmaker taught me that a long long time ago I, and i i love it and i'm tired i like i kind of get frustrated with with the the dressmakers because I don't feel like they take this seriously enough as someone who takes this really seriously. Um, What are your different strategies for like, have you ever tried to build relationships with retail books and it's just like not gone anywhere? Or uh, I'm, I'm curious, like, have you, because it seems like you have good relationships with some bookmakers. Has that just not really uh, translated to the regulated U S market? Yeah, listen, some of my best friends in the world are bookmakers. Um, but, you know, when it comes to regulated book, bookmakers, you know, listen, I, I'm, I'm friendly with a few. Um, and there's a few that I'm friends with that won't even let me play. Um, and that's it. I just, you know, you accept the fact that they won't let me play. Um, and I think they have accepted the fact that I will find a way to get in somehow, some way. So just one of those things in which you just understand that, you know, if I was a bookmaker, um, and this is just me, and if I know, and if I could get, you know, if I could book somebody that's sharp, I would want that work, and I would want to keep him at bay, give him fair limits, and then hopefully he would keep his word, shake my hand, and say, "Listen, I'm the only, I'm the, you're, I'm, you know, you're, you're not putting any beards into me." Versus, yeah. versus, okay, I'm gonna just kick you out. Thanks for, not, thanks for doing business, and now you don't know who's the beard and who isn't, what's happening, and then. It's actually, and, and, I, and I guarantee this, that everybody that's kicked me out so far that has limited me, I promise you that they have lost a lot more money than they would have had they kept me on direct. Because when I tell somebody, I'm, you know, again, in this business, GP, I, I'm come up from the credit world. I make, I make deals, million dollar handshakes. If I give you my word, I'm the only guy that's betting into this. 
uh, into into your office. I'm the only guy betting. I'm not, I don't have multiple accounts. And if I did, I would tell you, this guy gave me this account. Can I bet into this? Yes or no? If he tells me no, and, and even betting partners, they would try to give me different accounts offshore. And I'd say, listen, I'm sorry, I can't take this account. I'm friendly with the owners. So, I, you know, I I, I, I take pride in, in, in being a man of my word. Um, however, the minute you kick me out and the minute you limit me and show me the door, then the gloves are off and I got to do what I got to do. And, and, and that's the thing. And I just, you know, they think that you think that you solved the problem, but you really, have, you know, it, it, it's just escalated because, um, you know, they think, oh, don't worry about it. We'll just find a way and we'll find you again and we'll just kick you out again after three days after we see the line go from, you know, seven to nine. We know it's you or we know it's one of you guys, um, but not necessarily. I agree with that. I have similar I have a similar feeling for the books that have limited me and, and kicked me out. I think it was probably a negative PL decision for them. And I think it sometimes is just generally a negative PL decision if they think that that's going to stop them from losing money and not investing time into being like decent at setting lines. Because all of a sudden you have, you kick out like a bunch of people who aren't, you know, maybe they're just kind of, uh, they're here for a short amount of time. They're here to make a quick buck. They're not going to go through the hoops of finding a whale, um, finding a VIP account, you know, setting up betting partners. But like the real like motherfuckers are going to go out and like make it twelve times worse because the difference between what you let a whale bet at DraftKings and what you let a limit like a limited sharp is like you know so so big. So you're just opening yourselves up to just getting. <laughs> getting punched in the face, I feel like. That, that, that's, that, that's the unfortunate. I, you know, it's funny because the marketing budget at some of these sports books are unbelievable. And they actually, most of them have a team that they employ to say, okay, who are we going to kick out this week? Or who, who, if they only brought in talented bookmakers, and if that bookmaker even held a half a percent, a half of circa – Circus talent is able to hold 3%, and they book everybody in the world. If these guys, you know, and you can't expect a talent, a bookmaker to hire talent as good as Circus. Let's just say you only held a half a percent just to these sharps. That money that you would be holding, because of the volume that you would be writing, it still would be an incredible amount of money. You'd wind up making more money than having to find a way to kick all these people out. But of course not. They did because they don't know how to find talent. I just don't understand. It doesn't make economic sense to me. Um, I disagree with it. And like you said, um, you think that your investigators are guys that are searching for accounts. If you think running a closing line value report is, um, you know, that's so three, four, five years ago. We're past that bullshit now. Um, and of course, the worst thing a bookmaker ever wants to do is, is, is incorrectly kick out a winning gambler that is actually a long-term loser. So you might, you know, so then you have to question yourself, is this guy a winner or is this guy a loser? Is he just getting lucky or is he really that good? And if you're not moving on action, if you're not booking to that guy, you're going to make the wrong decision by just saying, you know what, let's just kick him out. It's too hard to tell. You're leaving so much money on the table and actually having your competition um, grabs a player like that. And um, so that's why, you know, handling the whales is such a, such an, such a skill and the way to um, ensure that that skill, um, you know, from a bookmaker standpoint, to ensure that skill is performed to the utmost ability requires to have um, skillful, bo skillful, skillful bookmakers employed. Now, here's a question, Spanky. That's something I'm wondering. If you were given the opportunity to run DraftKings, because of what you said, like you're a skill, you could bring some skill to it. And they were like, Jason Robbins can't tell you anything. You get to run it however you want it. Um, you get some good deal that makes sense to you financially. Like, would you do it? Would you find that interesting? Yeah, listen, I, you know, I, I'm very well off, you know, uh, knock on wood. Um, if I were to come in as a consultant <laughs> to any one of these sports books for a year, um, and with a place that already had that kind of business, like a DraftKings, I'm very confident that I could, that I could, that I could, that I, whatever they would pay me, um, um, would, uh, would, would, would be, uh, uh, 
I, I would definitely be able to make them that m- many more times in return. Um, and I, 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 you know, but, but it would, it would, it would, it would take a lot out of me because I would, you know, I, it would be a hard job for me to do. I'm not looking for another job in my life right now. I, my plate's pretty full, Yeah. but you know, but, but I'm, I'm sure I would perform very well at it. Listen, you, I make a living laying 110, you know, and I'm not trying to downplay taking 110 is not easier. You know, even though you have the mat, because I make a living with the sniper rifle in my hand, I get to choose who I could fire. Where now, when you're, even though you're taking 110, you got that shield, and you're getting hit from all angles, all sides. So it's a hard, hard job. And the best bookmakers in the world, I have nothing but respect for them. So it's very, very difficult. Do I think I would perform well at it? Maybe I think I would definitely add value, or I would hire the talent required to be able to 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 to, to make to turn a bigger profit um, for any company out there that has uh, that already has uh, a good customer base. Yeah, and you know certainly certainly DraftKings has a massive customer yes. base, so I think that there is a lot of opportunity there. Since as we know, like they're pretty weak from a from a bookmaking standpoint, I've always I've always wondered why they don't sharpen up just a, just a little bit, but you know, that's, that's that world with the marketers and whatnot running, running those books instead of the the sports better. So, you know, maybe I guess they're doing something right. I don't know, but uh, my, I want to get back to a couple quick top down strategies. Then I want to talk about bet bash because that's coming up and we want to get a lot of people there. Um, for people who now understand steam chasing, right? Let's say that you're you're you open up spank odds and you see, you know, part of part of your play is you know stale lines, right? You see you have a Bet Rivers account, you're just trying to see a couple go through the hoop. You bet Bet Rivers is incredibly slow, or, you know, and you just you pick them off when when the market moves. That's great, but now your Bet Rivers account's down and you don't want to kind of fuck yourself over on FanDuel or DraftKings. What uh what are we looking for? Are we pulling up uh you know circa and seeing how the lines kind of moving over the day? Are we pulling up to make sure which check which books are taking the biggest limits? Like to go from that basic, basic, basic top down to that more advanced top down strategy that's really kind of made you rich over the years, what's that next step for that steam chaser? Well, you know, I, I gave three examples of a top-down betting. You yeah. just touched on a fourth one that I, I didn't even mention, but we could get into it. You know, limit, yeah. limit changes. Yeah. Um, you know, watching a book's limits is 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 that alone? I've probably uh, countless of millions of dollars over the years just on that alone that I that, that we're able just knowing how a, looking at line history and watching line history, but also limit history. And that's so important, knowing how a book's, because, listen, every sharp sports better is trying to, the, what's the bookmaker's job? The bookmaker's job is trying to get to the closing line as fast as possible, in a, as, a booking as low as the limit as possible. The, bu- the sharp better's job is to try to get the best line possible for the most down possible. Um, and then, so what's going to happen? They have to do, there's, there's a balance there where, you know, and again, I'm talking about the sharp better, the sharp syndicate. I'm not talking about the guy that's been a dime a game, two dimes a game, betting overnights. I'm talking about guys that are getting big, serious money. They need to get down a significant amount of money. So how do we do that? You know, so, so the way to do it is you have to know when bookmakers increase your limits or when they're confident to increase your limits, what time of day it happens or when they know, you know, and then, and then to be able to pound accordingly. Um, historically 11 a.m. Eastern was when Grande would open up and the world would open up. Grande is no longer part of the ecosystem, but you know, that's historically, that's when it used to happen, 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, uh, but then, you know, and then for the football games, it was usually 10 30 a.m. Eastern when Chris would uh, go up, um, for, for football limits. Everything, a lot of things have stayed the same, but a lot of things have changed. Um, and, and, and the, 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 you know, limits, the closer you get to game time, the more information that, that that that's known which means the limit should go up um so th- knowing when the limits go up and knowing how to watch those line moves can help you anticipate those line moves accordingly now i don't want to 
go too much in depth. I think I've given enough information. I think that you got to do the work yourself. But on Spank Odds, we have from some of the biggest bookmakers out there, Chris Pinnacle, Circa, um, um, I think they're also Sunday bets now poster limits, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. And if they haven't, they might be poster limits soon. No, I saw it yesterday or two days ago. Okay, so Sunday bets has their limits up there. So okay. these guys, this, these are very important numbers to look at. Um, because again, you know, what is the difference? Um, you know, every time somebody tells me, oh man, did you see that line at this place? Uh, they got a five and everybody got a seven, you know, the, any, any better sharper square is going to say, really, what are they taking on that five? Um, that's the second question. You know what I mean? Uh, it's only a promotion. They're only taking a hundred bucks. Okay. Next, next topic. You know what I mean? We don't want to talk. You know what I mean? Oh, it's a boost or some bullshit. That they, oh, no, I don't give a shit about boosts. You know what I mean? Boost. You know, I, I, all I want to, I want to bet big. And, 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 and that's the thing. Now, let's just say somebody like a Circa is hanging a four when the world's painted five and Circa's taking 20 dimes, 30 dimes. Okay. Something's happening here. Circa really is dying for you to lay that four. Um, you know, and then lo and behold, you'll realize soon enough when you see situations like that, that you'll see, wait a minute, that line eventually winds up closing three and a half and, um, and, or four. And then you, you say, okay, this is another way to anticipate line movement. Exactly. And I think do, doing your own work, is so important. I, the one thing I would say for, and I'm not an exper- experienced top down better like you are, but go to the spank odds, go to the odds screen and think about it from the view of the smart people, smart syndicates, the smart bookmakers, and just try and see what they might be doing. I love opening up the betting history, seeing how lines have kind of come up, come back, you know, resistance, uh, momentum, which is, you know, more from a trading, but I think that's, that's also very important in, in bookmaking because, you know, also, bookmakers might move a line themselves to see if there's any resistance, a point up or two, and you know, exactly. Looking, yeah, you hit the, a big thing. Also, just to, again, I'm not to trying to tout spank odds so much, but I just think that spank odds actually helps you figure a lot of this out. Is these line alerts that we have, yep. line moves like you, you can set an alert. You know, let's just say an NFL game, you know, NFL season. But let's just say an NFL game is painted seven. It's seven everywhere. I can set a line alert. Let me know. If any bookmaker goes to six and a half or any bookmaker goes to seven and a half, I want to know. Everyone's painted seven for the most part. Let me know if somebody goes off that number. And then I want to make a determination. Is this an indication of what's to come? Was this a book? You know, you could you make the call as you see it. So you could set all these different line alerts and then act accordingly. There's just so many things. And, you know, my spank odds, I have 15, 16 line alerts, different ones to help me spot sharp moves, to help me spot fakes, to help me spot, you know, anticipate different things on sides or totals sometimes again a, 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 a typical you know you know most of the time when a game is steaming or a game is moving you know usually hit this you know the way it works is usually hit the uh the spread and then you hit the money line and then the first half spread or the first half money line you know what i mean so usually what we used to do back in the day if we had a, if we had a quick out we couldn't get to them and somebody would bet the spread we would just like not even go for anything else. We go right to the first half money line. Yep, yep, yep. Just because we, we have a chance to catch something like that. These are little things, but now a lot of people say, you know what? People are looking at the spread. Let's bet the first half first and then bet the full game because bookmakers don't react to the first half because they're not moving the spread, which is a crazy thing where, you know, everything should move in unison. It's all correlated. Bookmaker software can't do that today, where if somebody bets the full game, everything from the first quarter, first half, every second quarter, third, everything should move a certain percentage. It doesn't happen that way. So what, but what do you have to do? Because people are looking at the first, the full game, attack some, a lot of syndicates will attack the first half initially before attacking the full game. Some people just attack halves and only exclusively. But I'm just saying these little things you just learn to look for and learn to adjust on. And it just, you know, I can't teach everybody everything. This is decades of experience. And I'm not even betting as much these days. But my guys in my office here, um, they're on top of this whole shit. And it's funny because there's going to be, we're going to have a seminar at Bet Bash. I know we're going to get into it. 
<coughs> but we're going to have a seminar at BetBash where we're going to have somebody um, showing people how to use spank odds in real time and um, teaching them some of the tricks of the trade um, on what we think is, is the most valuable pieces. Let's get into let's get into bet bash because if we back up, you said what you're going to be the best at information, and I found that like since I've put myself out there and been more public, I haven't earned any any money from like this like directly, but indirectly, the amount of connections and inter, you know information I've gotten has I mean it's been a game changer, and I I have to imagine that. That's the value prop of, of Bet Bash too, which is get you in the room with a lot of people who think about this, who might know something you might not, who might have outs, who might have models but no outs, who, you know, whatever it is, there's complementary pieces, right? And yeah, like uh, talk uh, talk a little bit about Bet Bash and why why we should all go. You, you, again, you just said it, man. Uh, if you want to start running commercials for me, let me know what your rate is. GP, I'm in. I'm in. That sounded. Uh, you, you said API. it exactly. <laughs> API you, access. You, yeah, well, I, I don't know. If you're yeah. But you, 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 you said it best. It's it's guys. You're connecting, trying to complement different skill sets. You know, very few people have it all. Um, you know, usually the best handicappers in the world don't have money. A lot of the people that have a lot of money. Don't know how to pick winners. A lot of people that have outs don't know how to pick winners. Or usually sometimes could be broke. Sometimes they have money. You don't know. You know, some people just have money. You know, so, so there's just so many different things. Some people have two of the th- three things. or There's so many different facets that come to Bet Bash. And then, it, you know, I can't begin to explain the number of connections, both publicly known and not publicly known, that have been created at BetBash the last three years by people either in a speed networking event that we have where we pair you up based on a short two-minute questionnaire that you fill out or at the bar that people have just made connections. It's the most un- it's the only sports betting networking conference of its kind where we welcome every single person from the amateur sports better to the world's best sports betters. Um, like Billy Walters, for example, who comes to Bet Bash now. Um, you know, th- and, and everybody in between. This is the go-to and the only sports gambling conference for the betters. This is not an industry jerk, uh, circle jerk, where everybody's like, oh, yeah, we're going to, you know, oh, great job there. And all the CEOs are meeting together and shit. And, hey, yeah, you know, thinking, you know, I created Bet Bash. The reason why I always say this story because I find it so uh, um, uh, uh, ironic how this came to be. But I was at a sports betting network, a sports betting conference run by uh, by a company that's well known and a nice company. They run good conferences, but they had a panel titled "What Do Sports Betters Want?" And I'm sitting there in the audience, and there's not one sports better on that panel. And and I see these people pretending like they're experts. None of them knew shit, and they're talking about what I want. And 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 it just un- I said, "There's a void here. There's a void." where these people are so out of touch with the lifeblood of our industry, the customer, the customer. And I just don't understand how, and I'm hoping, we're going to try to change that trend. But several bookmakers have started coming to BetBash. We get more and more coming every year. We're hoping to get some regulators in this year. We're trying to get people that come because this is where the customers go. If you want to know what the customers think of your product and I get an honest review, here you go. A lot of bookmakers are scared to face the heat. Oh, they're going to tell me, why are you limiting me? Okay, well, you know, if you're limiting people, maybe you should stop limiting people. Or maybe you should get some constructive criticism. Or maybe you have a valid reason why you're limiting people. Why don't you have a conversation? Nobody's going to, you know, this is a, it's a debate that we could all have, um, you know, and try to make as a whole – the ecosystem, the environment, the sports betting environment that we know in the United States better, bigger, and for for everybody to be able to prosper. And I think that um, and and I think that 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 that's that's our goal. And um, I hope to see everybody there, August sixth through the ninth, betbash.co.
And it's it's at Circa, right? It's hosted at Circa, yeah, at Circa Resort in Las Vegas. Also includes a sports gambling hall of fame. All the details are on our website. It's 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 you know we we take we take pride in running this. Um, we don't make any money, although I I, I expect uh, to make a profit this year because you know for the last three years we really you know we've been, I've been doing this um, out of the Spanky Fund. And don't get me wrong, the bank of Spank is still strong, but <laughs> I, I, I gotta I want to try to maybe uh, make a business out of this as you know uh, uh, and and try to you know again I'm not you know, this is gonna be you know, not a huge business, but it's nice to be able to have just an extra business so that everybody could get paid and everybody. You know the hard work can pay off, and then we could bring everybody together because it's not cheap to do this. Let's be honest. I'm sure it's not cheap, or it's not easy to plan. You know? Not easy at all. And kudos to the circus staff. Like you know, what I mean, these guys. Without them, I'd, I'd be you know, bet bash would be bet trash. Um, you know, and, and and my 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 crew. I have an incredible crew, so um, I'm I'm thankful to them. Without them, bet bash wouldn't be what it is today. Well. You know, last year I we were we were talking before on a phone call, but I was going to come and I actually like last minute, uh, literally closed on a house and had to cancel. I was so excited to go. I'm for sure going this year, and I'm excited because I've met a lot of new friends now uh, online through just content and, and whatnot who I know will be there, and it really it really looks like a ton of fun and. As someone who's gone to Las Vegas a lot, like going to Vegas for three days, that's perfect. That's perfect right there, you know. Absolutely. Like, you'll have a I, good time. And you know what, GP, just to just to add to that, you know, in your generation, a lot of you guys are the you know, the 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 digital internet age where everybody's texting and chatting and all this stuff. And I think it should be, you know, there's nothing more important than making a human face to face connection, putting a face to a voice, putting a face to a screen name. I think, you know, as, as human beings, um, there's, you know, there's nothing more important, at least to me, because if I shake somebody's hand, it's very more, it's, it's so much more important to me than if I just make an arrangement, um, over the phone or, uh, or, or on a chat on a text message, um, well, don't get me wrong. I've had some of the world's biggest bookmakers that I've placed, you know, again, over Skype, you know what I mean? But I've never met in my life. But I, would I have loved to meet them? Sure. Um, but some of them would probably not have liked to meet me. But that's a different story. Uh, but, yeah, but I'm just saying, you know, um, it, it's important to be able to make that connection. I think that human connection, face-to-face, nothing's better. And um, I, we have a good time, five open bars, the list goes on and on. It's an incredible event. I can't wait to, to see you there, my man. And yep. um, and um, I look forward to having everybody there. And um, to anybody that's that's aspiring, that want that's shy, or that wants to get there, I'll, I'll you just walk up to me. I'll introduce you. Tell me what you need, who you need to talk to, and I'll bring you to whoever I think is best at the time. I'll look around. I've made so many connections that way, and I've made. I, I've, I, I'm happy to be matchmaker, um, and uh, and um, it, it's 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 a pleasure of mine, and it's really I really love it. Yeah, is it? It's awesome because it's it's beyond just making money, right? Like I think in this business, it, we're often measured or measure ourselves by our P and L, but it can be kind of lonely, and you get kicked out of books, and you have bookmakers screaming at you, and you know, your relatives being like, oh, you do what for a living? You know, it's like to go to Bet Bash, to be around your people, to meet new people. Uh, I got to imagine that's just like good for the soul. So I, you know, I can't wait to go. I recommend everybody go and, you know, let's all meet up and just have, have a good time amongst like our crew, right? I love it, man. I, again, you said it best. We're amongst our people. Very few people understand that we like to bet you know, the people who go to Bed Bash like to bet. Some of them for a living, some of them really highly recreational. This is what we do. And guess what? Because you're an avid gambler, you're going to fit right in. Because we all like the same shit. This is what we do. And believe me, we all in our regular lives, we don't have people, we don't hang around with people that bet like we bet. So it's like a brotherhood, a fraternity um, that we're together in this thing that we call sports gambling, trying to get the best of it. Love it. I feel like that's a good a good way to cap it off so people immediately go register for Bet Bash after 
this episode. So I'll put all of that info in the show notes for, I'll put Spank Odds, Bet Bash. Please sign up for Bet Bash though, because I would love to, especially if you're listening to this and like, you know, we've talked online or whatnot, I would love to, to see you there too. So I'm looking forward to meeting like a ton of people, looking forward to meeting you, Spanky, face to face. And thank you so much for coming on. I mean, I, I, like I said, it's not a hyperbole, like, you know, you're, you're like a bucket list guest and somebody who's really shaped my sports betting journey. And I can't say for sure that I'd be sitting here if it weren't for, you know, you and your podcast. So please, you know, thank you again. Listen, that, that was, uh, let me just, uh, you know, hearing these words, I, you know, again, I, <laughs> It really touches me, man, because I'm just a better. I'm just a gambler. I never thought I was going to touch anybody's life except my four kids. Um, you know what I mean? So, so, so when you say something like that to me, you know, brings – I'm close to getting a tear in my eye because this is – you know, I, I I did my podcast and I did this. You know, you know, my ultimate goal is to try to make money. And I'm going to be honest. Like, I mean, sure. I'm, I'm not I'm, – I'm, I'm trying to make more money. I'm trying to get more rounds. I'm trying to get down more. Okay. But the byproduct of it is, you know what? Maybe I can make people better, betters. Maybe I could touch some, you know, maybe I could help one or two guys out. And to hear something like that from you, my man, to be as successful, as see how successful you've become. And to say that, you know, you wouldn't be where you are today if it wasn't for a joker like me, that is unbelievable for you to say that to me because I, um, I, I, I can't, I can't even thank you, man. Like, you know, like, uh, you know. It no, really I, means the world, but I, I don't, I don't, I really, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I have no words. Like I'm, I'm touched. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy for you, brother. Dude, I, I appreciate it. I'm sure I'm not, I'm not the only one. So, um, yeah, man, I, so happy to finally get to, to get to do this with you, and, you know, really look forward to, to. Just being uh being more a part of the industry, getting to know you better, going to Bet Bash and you know, fighting for a good, healthy online sports betting or sports betting industry in the US. Like I I know that you're out there fighting the good fight and like that's something I, I try to do too. So um looking forward to to fighting that fight together, man. Thank you, brother. It means a lot. Man.